Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Future Frenzy. I'm your host, Sven Patzer, and today we have with us Jose Servino. Jose Servino is an entrepreneur with half a decade of tech and business experience. He has a strong background in software engineering, business, and real estate with a proven track record of stepping up to technical and non-technical leadership roles across industries. Starting his tech career as a consultant node engineer on the Google Cloud Platform, Jose quickly developed as a software engineer working on talented AI teams at Blue Orange for Wall Street firms like Point72 and PAAS firms at Materially, a zero to one startup founded by an MIT MBA graduate. He also co-founded companies like Reason, a software de- development agency, which grew to half a million ARR in its first few months in business, and the Extension School, a pro bono venture with upwards of $2 million in estimated impact to the lives of entry-level engineers. Jose is currently founder and CEO of Servino Enterprises, a private equity and consulting firm inspired by his advisor and mentor, Roland Frazier, and the years he spent helping free his parents from the small business that they ran. He aims to do the same for other entrepreneurs looking to transform their lives through growth and a business exit using his tech and small business expertise. We are thankful to have him on today, and here we are. Hey, I'm Sven, your host, and I'm here with Jose Sabino. Uh, We are going to talk about AI today, Uh, what artificial intelligence is, where it comes from, uh, how we can use it, uh, and what are the concerns behind it and more. So I I guess to start off, um, people are finally starting to get an understanding of what artificial intelligence is because they're seeing it so much in the news. Uh, I think that uh, the news has, been, has done a really good job of uh, keeping people informed on all the new developments in the space. Uh, and so I think people who are unaware of the capabilities that ChatGPT has, but listen in to this podcast, are able to actually uh, leave knowing some more beneficial skills and uh, some ha- just have some different tools to use uh, when it comes to uh, technology. So I, I guess to begin, uh, Jose, where does artificial intelligence come from? All right. Uh, well, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me, Sven. Uh, so where does artificial intelligence come from? Um, I mean, it's a form of computing. So from computer scientists, it really started back in the day, as far as I, as far as I know, back in the seventies, maybe even before then. Um, so it's been around for a while. It's just only just recently become something that we talk about because it's become much more capable uh, than it used to be before. So back in the day, what? What were people uh, able to do with the with that sort of machine learning or AI at the time? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I I can't really answer that question, um, but I can just assume that they they were very rudimentary things. Uh, maybe the equivalent of a one plus one equals two, and trying to predict uh, things similar to that. And so since you have, you've been in the space for longer than uh, this AI has, has been a boom in AI summer, um, how has it been changing and developing in the past couple of years? Because it was a relatively small field uh, and now it's just, it seems like it's everywhere. So what really in the past couple of years has been the, the big uh, changing factor when, when it comes to creating this stuff? That's a really good question. So back in the day when I worked at an AI agency and I would speak with the machine learning engineers, um, it seems like it seems like back then they were having, and I think we still have the same issue with AI nowadays when we're training models, but 
an issue with uh, dirty and clean data. And and I can only assume that considering the progress that we're making in, in computing power and also in cheapening uh, electricity overall or power or energy, that it's that we're starting to reach an inflection point in research and and the availability of computing that we're starting to see larger uh, language models or larger models being capable of, uh, of some, form, some form of training. And that has to be honestly like uh, credit out to AWS and other cloud computing platforms for making that possible. I believe that's how ChatGPT or the OpenAI team is, is training their models. That's really interesting. Um, and so it, has it been uh, in any way related to like the way we've developed 3G to 4G to 5G, as in we have like the GPT-3, GPT-3.5. It seems like it's kind of a similar... Uh... Uh, honestly, no, no, they aren't, they aren't really correlated. I mean, if anything, you could assume that maybe if you want to stream all this data while training it, that you could, you could say that they're somehow correlated, but they aren't correlated at all um, because because genuinely the the data sits in in a in a remote warehouse and then you train train the data on it and it doesn't have to do with uh, you know LTE and and 5G and all these things. Yeah, I, I'm not saying directly correlated, but more of a like we are we're developing our technology further and further, and so it seems like it's uh, it's easier to hit milestones today. Uh, than it was before as as we're able to crank out uh new new versions of technology uh in, in the same year right um right. So, no, it, it, that is impressive honestly um and that's it's actually more maybe a culture of it's i think maybe it's two things right it's the culture uh or the pace of innovation that's just natural in the tech industry um but it's also the pace of of, uh, of investment as well um, over the years, over decades, and finally seeing it all turn into a spark. And we have to acknowledge the fact that, I mean, ChatGPT is like this breakthrough app, but it still isn't anywhere close to what AI is truly capable of just yet. It's our first encounter with, with what we perceive to be a general AI, but it isn't in, in the slightest. It's just, um, it's just a large language model. It's, it's text-based. So what are some things that people say who are really new to, to chat GPT and AI? Uh, what could they sign in to chat GPT and, and do uh, with the software uh, to make their work easier or to make communication easier, schoolwork easier, forms, uh, anything like that? Right, so what, what would I tell somebody who's completely new to ChatGPT? Like, how do they leverage it in their day to day? Yep. Okay. So, I think the first thing, first things first, experiment with it. Uh, see, see what you're you're sit down five minutes. See what you know, kind of curiosities it can answer. Start playing around with what it responds with, and see how far you can push it. And you'll see kind of quickly that there's a limit to what it can do. Um, and, and the out and the quality of the outputs as well. Um, but you know, long story short, what I found it useful for, and there's like maybe a range here of what's transformative and what's just generally just, you know, helpful. Um, on the helpful side, it's quick research where Google shares five, 10 things that, you know, are generally applicable to the search that I that I put into their query box. And ChatGPT essentially consolidates all that and just gives me an actual straight answer. It's very different. It's a very different dynamic, a very different UX there. So it's much more enjoyable in that in that regard, even though you have to wait a bit for the prompt to, to complete. Um, but then on the more transformative side, it's more like comparing doing a task to completing a workflow or completing, um, you know, overall objective, right? So you can complete one task, but if you apply it to an overall operation or, or a workflow, then and it can then, then it becomes much more apparent the, the efficiencies or the op optimization that it kind of provides here. So on the, on the transformative side, I have to say that 
learning. Learning with ChatGPT has been one of the biggest ROIs um, that I've seen. Uh, when I was working as a software engineer just recently, there were it, it would take sometimes like 30 minutes to, to a couple of hours to find some really deep technical uh, solutions to, to whatever I'm dealing with on a platform. But ChatGPT, because it kind of already aggregates um, all this information on the web, um, even back to 2021, it can give me more direct answers to those to those workflows. Um, but to, to back, back to the education side, if you were to have a list of topics, and I, and I did this with with some programming, um, some programming topics, if you have a list of, of like subtopics or a list of things that you want to run through, it can, you can ask it. All right, explain it to me in a way that I understand, and then give me precise examples that I personally would most connect with, I would say, um, and then give me maybe practice problems to use and then use them in in like a in a coding environment. Of course, there's a there's a thing where, with ChatGPT where essentially it's like 90% right sometimes, right? So and especially with code, even though they're really working on that right now, but sometimes they're only 90% right. Um, and and that's, if anything, an opportunity in the education space as well to be able to understand when something is right or wrong in the output and then being able to correct for that. So, yeah, I mean, if I were to if I were to be back in high school and I had access to chat GPT, I think uh, one thing that I might want to do is say I had a, a book assignment and I was having trouble understanding a passage in the book, um, I could just take the passage in the book, no matter really where it was published and, and be able to have that uh, summarized and, and broken down to a level that I could understand um, because you, you're able to tell ChatGPT, hey, I'm in high school and this is I'm working on an assignment, or hey, I'm a I'm a high school teacher and I'm trying to to add this to my curriculum. What sort of uh, questions might might the students we're teaching have? Uh, and, and then I I don't know. I I, I think that. Sim <laughs> simple things like that show that there's a lot of potential for use in education um and i know that we're just scratching the surface right now um but i i guess um i'm sure people are also wondering if you know amazon alexa has been around for a while is that considered like ai um, in a way, you know, I, I don't know what's going on under the hood with a with Alexa, but I would assume that there there is, in order to understand basically the, the voice text and then being being able to map that to actual to actions on their platform, that there's some form of AI going on there. Yeah, is Siri, that... Google search. Yeah. So if you're saying OpenAI is powered through AWS, do you think that uh, devices like that are, are powered through that cloud computing as well? Definitely. Okay, Definitely. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, I, I, I guess I didn't really uh, look into those questions as much before. So, so that's super interesting. Um, and so what you do with your company is you use super, super advanced uh, chat GPT prompts, correct? In some areas of the, of the company, yes. And how, if you had to describe that a little bit for somebody uh, who, who needs to hear it in layman's terms, um, how, how do you think you could explain it to them uh, in the hopes that they might be able to uh, apply prompts to their business. Okay, in super layman's terms. Okay, here it is. So any major task 
where you don't really know right from wrong, where you need to learn first principles and frameworks to use, you can ask ChatGPT for them and you'll get basically Pareto's principle like right off the bat. You'll get the 20% of that of, of a prompt of a, of a set of principles that get you 80% of the result, right? Um, and it becomes a way to get to good enough extremely fast, right? Now, the more advanced parts of it is essentially fine tuning the prompt, fine tuning the amount of, of information that you're giving it um, and properly labeling that information. So then it gives you the proper responses, but that is all basically just a, a function of, of, of your need, right? Um, so, so yeah, so in layman's terms, you can get very good, very fast at just about anything. Um, and you can get about maybe five to 10 times as much done in the same amount of time. You don't have to take, you don't have to spend the 20 hours learning like the, the bare minimum. You only need about five to 10 minutes. So what if we run through some like basic use cases uh, for chat GPT for people that may be in professions already, uh, but have not looked into this AI thing at all? Uh, maybe maybe they're just uh, older or, or haven't thought it's been relevant until it's it's been blasted all over the media. So say, uh, say you're a doctor. I, I recently saw and made a post about uh, chat GPT passing the uh, US medical exam. Uh, and so my, my question is, if you're a, a nurse or a doctor, uh, what sort of benefit do you think that you could have from chat GPT? Well, I can, I can assume that if you're a doctor, a nurse, or any sort of professional that, um, but specifically doctor and nurse, that essentially you can get to the information that you need faster. So you can actually input a series of uh, symptoms potentially, and you'll receive the right output or a good enough idea as to what to look for in, in the patient. Now, I can't really speak too much on that because, you know, I'm not a doctor um, and I don't have medical background, but I can only assume that considering what I've seen, you know, the impact that, it, that ChatGPT has had in my learning, in my, in my business and in my personal life, that it can transform their their search and and hypothesizing, um, you know, dramatically, as dramatically as it has been. Okay, maybe, maybe that's a little tougher because it, it requires a degree to talk about, but uh, here's an example that that could be used in, in a lot of uh, areas. So say you're selling, you're selling solar, like you're selling solar panels to people. Um, how could you use the technology to find clients easier or be able to uh, develop email lists quicker or, or things like that. So if you were to put yourself in the position of a, of a basic salesperson, uh, how could they improve and, uh, you know, take their sales to the next level? That's, that's a really interesting question because I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of sales right now. So basically, you know, in, in sales, there's a workflow. There's A to Z and there's, there's steps along which a prospect has to go in order to become a close client and a, and a you know, happy customer. Along each one of those points, you basically have objections or you have questions um, and you can ask ChatGPT to answer those objections, give you answers to those questions. Um, but in terms of lead sourcing as well, you can also ask maybe ChatGPT4, which has more recent up-to-date information on, on the web, exactly where the, this type of avatar, this type of person, right, uh, tends to spend the most time. Now, it might not have the exact right answer, right? It might have a broad answer, but it'll give you a good enough start so that you can get the ball rolling and you aren't left knowing nothing, right? So it's it really is, it changes the pace at which you can accomplish your basic tasks in, in ways that very few other tools have ever, you know, had or done. That, I think that is an awesome answer. And I think, 
questions like these are going to be easier to answer than you know a, a doctor md uh sort of question so maybe another use case uh that that people uh might be interested in doing is um using chat gpt to help with their taxes um do you do you know how people have been uh utilizing it to to do government forms and and similar things of that nature because uh you know government's so automated and, and boring it it seems like a, a robot would be the perfect solution yeah yeah you know that is one of those areas where we should definitely optimize we should definitely leverage this type of ai this type of conversational ai to to, to solve a lot of things but to the point i've actually used it for my taxes um, and the way that it has helped me the most is not in trying to find loopholes. It's been in trying to find exactly which forms to use. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and... But then second to that, second to that, um, in in like spreadsheets, what we're finding is that, you know, ChatGPT, there's an API underneath it. There's like a, a, a source, right? That any application can, can start to talk with. You can, use and if you look it up online you'll see that in a google sheet um, or now in my, the microsoft uh, you know office suite that you have these both you know chat kind of plugins and co-pilots there so if you have a large data set multiple different sheets you, it can essentially ingest it and start answering questions about that data in real time and that honestly is relatively transformative as well because you'd otherwise spend hours trying to understand advanced models or advanced uh, finances for a company, let's say, and and now it just answers questions. You don't have to do that those those hours of mental modeling. That yeah, that that's very very cool. Um, I I think it, there's so many use cases. It, it's it's really really uh, crazy, uh, and I think. Another thing that may be a little similar, uh, you know, it, when we're talking about use cases, uh, people who are just starting a business, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that that's necessary for um, starting a business is your uh, your marketing plan, and I think that um, as somebody who like despised uh developing one myself even though it's you know it is simple but uh just having the ability to um have a have a wingman or like somebody working with you basically the whole time it, it makes uh doing difficult forms and and difficult uh thinking and uh, a lot easier right if you ask it the right things so i i think some of my personal advice uh would also be maybe you know we've been using google for so long everybody's great with google sometimes there's a good uh use case to, to do searching on google and then uh inputting that into chat gpt to help you truly get to your objective uh and i i think there there's other similar things like that but but uh yeah i, I think uh a lot of use cases can be found uh, so right um i'm trying to think what else um do you think people may be uh, kind of floundering around about when it comes to AI. Have you seen, uh, like, read any message boards or, or heard from friends or family about any, like, questions they may have? People who are who are not within your uh, close circle of, of techies? Sure. So, I mean, truth is, I've actually been trying to spread the word of ChatGPT to, to most people that I know. Um, especially people who have to do a lot of knowledge work. So I actually made it like a, a, an objective of mine to to reach out to lawyers specifically um, because I know how much time that they spend in in you know at work um, 
you know, 12 hour days and so on. Um, so considering that ChatGPT and GPT-4 have passed the, the bar, I believe, um, with 95% accuracy, that it's a generally good enough co-pilot to help them accelerate a lot of their casework um, and maybe even try, you know, be, be act, you know, ChatGPT it can act as a role you can tell it to be an expert in, in marketing you can, you can tell it to be a judge you can tell it to be a criminal defense lawyer um, and you can actually argue it so i actually I, i've been telling people to and the lawyers to to use it as as a way to to get through a case if anything but it, long story short um, people don't know what questions to ask if anything there's a lot of fear going around about how powerful it can be and how much work it's going to displace and I think the that thinking is it's grounded in very basic human functions and it's natural, it's understandable, but there's so much promise here. And there's so much work to be done in the world that we can't stop from, from progressing forward. There's there's so much left to solve. And if AI can solve help us solve those those the hardest of problems and open up human talent to work on more important problems and allow for human talent to be better developed faster, then it isn't something to stop. Um, granted, maybe maybe pause it if we really need to, if we need to take a breather, but, but yeah, I mean, no, nobody's asking very many questions. If anything, it's fear response at times um, and a lot of calming them down. Because they, 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 people just need to calm down. It's, it's gonna be okay, just, learn you know keep going with it roll with it yeah i mean i would say the the biggest thing to people who are uh you know scared of it is it, this is your time to embrace it if you're afraid you're gonna lose your job uh because of this technology then get on the technology and be one of the people who's the best at leveraging it because uh it's not like the the jobs are going to completely go away they're just going to shift into different types of jobs and uh we're going to see that uh soon and i think no matter what you were uh no matter what sort of company you work for no matter what sort of job you do as as long as you're thinking um i i think that this could be really beneficial technology and there's no there's no reason to maybe there's reason to not progress to gpt5 and 6 and 7 yet but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh at least hop on and try to see how it could benefit your work like if if you're sitting there and you're like oh crap what do i do uh, and you you have a question instead of reaching out to a to a friend or to somebody else to a teacher just try using the chat bot and see uh if it comes up with a, a response that's suitable and you know you could even uh double check with the friend or the the teacher or whatever and, and uh and be able to see if it truly does work for you right right and i think maybe like a a really good way to think about it for people is that you know if you have a 40 hour work week this can help you make it a 10 hour, hour work week potentially and that's what i've heard for some marketers it's become just a couple hours a week to accomplish the same to, to, to accomplish the same output so i mean if, if anything this might help you live a much better life in the short term it's going to be it's going to make work much much easier then eventually you know, companies will expect more or pay less and, and we'll have to adapt to that. But, you know, long story short, it's it's phenomenal. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, this this feels like to me uh, dot com bus number two. And um, I people should should continue to, to hop on the technology and I'm going to keep talking about it. So so hopefully uh, we can keep spreading the word. And uh, I, I really appreciate having you on here, Jose, because I think you've provided a, a ton of insight to our listeners 
um, your background and, and your experience uh, is more extensive than what I personally have. Uh, and I think that it's always really beneficial to get uh, opinions of, of people who are truly leaders and innovators in this space. So, so thanks again for coming on. You know, I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Future Frenzy. I'm your host, Sven Patzer.